Good morning. Good to see all of you here this morning. Isn't that cool to see the way that the gospel has continued to spread and people have been invited to Mission Hills and into the family of God? Isn't that really cool to see that? I love watching that and as a part of that bumper. You know, the gospel is spreading. I love seeing what God's doing here at Mission Hills and, and, and being a part of that is so fun. Uh, seeing what God's doing around the globe and with missions is also amazing. I don't know if you read about that often. We often hear about the bad news in the world, but there's also great things happening around the world with the gospel going viral in countries. Uh, some countries we wouldn't even expect, some countries that we already know there's a church, but that church is continuing to grow. One of those is China. There's some amazing things going on in China. And, and I do a lot of reading about churches or past missionaries, past preachers who have done different things and made great impact. And one of the guys I recently read about was Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor, if you, if you don't know his legacy, he was a man who served faithfully in China for many years and uh, was doing some great ministry there. Really, if you ask any missionary in China today, they'll say he was kind of the forefather of, of missions in China. But though he had an impressive resume, though he had done great things, he understood that he served the Lord just as we do. We serve the Lord in all that we do. The gospel is the power. It's not us. It's in us. He was speaking at this church, a large Presbyterian church in Melbourne, Australia. This was later on in his life. I love this story. Let me share it with you. He's, he's getting ready to speak. He's primed. He has his message ready. So the moderator of the service introduces the missionary in this eloquent and glowing way. He tells the large congregation all that Taylor had accomplished in China. He lists his whole resume, and then he presented him as, quote, our illustrious guest. Taylor stood, went to the pulpit, opened his Bible and his notes, stood there quietly for a moment, and he said, dear friends, I am the little servant of an illustrious master. Though he had reason to be prideful, though in and of himself he could have said, well, listen to what God has done in me or through me. Listen to what's happened in China. He, he stopped and said, I'm just a little servant serving this splendid, amazing, magnificent master. Today we have the privilege of worshiping that same good and gracious God. We've done that already, but now we will turn our hearts attentive to hear what our splendid master has to say to us. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do acknowledge that you are the one who is great and we are not. Lord, I acknowledge to you that I am just a mere servant in your hand right now, and I pray that you will use me in a way to pierce all of our hearts, mine included, that your spirit will speak louder than my own words, that you use me, Lord, now to, to uh, let loose the, the lion of your spirit that is on the move in our congregation, that your word will be bold that human things will not get in the way, but divine things will change us completely. Father, I pray that you will be worshipped in our attentive hearts now. We yield ourselves to you. In your name, amen. Before I open up to our passage today, I want to give you free parenting advice. Okay? It's like the sermon before the sermon, okay? It's, it's from my own life. It's, it's something you should not do, though I did. It's something I did with my son. Now, I believe we as parents have a command to really invest in our kids' spiritual things, to instruct them in the way of the Lord, to read the Bible to them. Hopefully, if you are raising kids, you're doing that. How many of you have kids, just period? You have kids? Okay, wonderful. So that's most of you. How many of you have kids that you still tuck in bed at night, even if they're 26 wearing Star Wars pajamas? <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. So there's a lot of you in this room. Well, so there's children's Bibles that, that you can read to your kid at night, and I, I strongly recommend that. They're great Bibles. They're all over the place. You can find them at bookstores or, or online. There's some not-so-great ones, but then there's some. There's a few Bibles I've returned to the bookstore saying, hey, this children's Bible isn't biblical, right, because there are some that are not great. But there are some great ones. You can get them on your iPad. And, and, and there's stories in the Bible that are great for your kids, and I, I try to read those to my kids often. But maybe it's because I'm a pastor or a Bible nerd or whatever, but I, I th I've taken it upon myself to tell my children the stories that are not in the children's Bibles. And this is where you should learn from my mistake, okay? Because there is a reason that some stories are not in the children's Bibles, and, and one of those is the passage we're going to look at today. Now, now, this week, I decided I would tell Chandler 
the story. My four-year-old son, I would tell him the story right before bed. So he's sitting on his bed, and, and I told him the story of the passage we're going to look at today, and he's captivated. He's glued. He's loving it. And I'm like, look at this. My own son is loving my preaching. This is great, right? He's glued to me, and, and, and I'm telling him, and his whole face is changing. And, and I thought it was excitement. I think it was probably every emotion in his little body was colliding. But I didn't realize that fear was rising quickly to the top. And I got to the end of the story where I said, and King Herod was eaten by worms. And he's just terrified, right? He's looking at me like, and then silence, no movement. And he just whispers, that was awesome. <laughs> okay, again, learn from my mistake. That was awesome in the moment when he's awake, right? But it causes terrible nightmares for small children later when you tell them that people are eaten by worms. So don't do that, all right? Don't, don't tell certain stories to your children until they're a certain age, all right? But let's look at this passage together. It's in Acts chapter 12. If you need a Bible, you can use the one in the seats in front of you. It's on page 921 in the ESV or in those Bibles in front of you. And, and we're going to look at verses 20 through 24, just four verses today. But, but there's quite a story here that I want you to understand. As you're flipping there, let me give you a little bit of background. If you've been with us the last few weeks, you know what Pastor Mike's been leading us through as he's faithfully told us about the killing of James and what was happening there, the rise of King Herod's anger towards the Christians, and then the miracle of Peter being released from prison. Make sure you understand that story leading up to the passage today that that there was this rise of Christianity, but also at the same time, a rise of anger or animosity toward the Christians, specifically from King Herod. King Herod had beheaded James or, or killed him by the sword, we're told, early on in the beginning of chapter 12. He saw that it pleased the Jews, which we'll talk about more in a moment, and then he went and captured Peter. He put Peter in prison, guards around him, guards outside the cell. The Lord frees Peter. He, he allows him to go free from the prison that he's in. In verse 19, you can see this caused King Herod to be very upset. He cross-examined the guards. He's like, wait a second, some, one, some, one of you is lying to me for sure. There's no way he just got up and walked out of here, underestimating the power of God, right? And so after he cross-examines them, he kills them. He's angry, and he flees to Caesarea, which would have been on the coast. And that's where we pick up in verse 20. Uh, let's read this, follow along with me. It says, Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they came to him with one, ac with one accord. Not in one accord, not one Honda accord, okay? They're all together in one accord, all right? They came to him in one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robe, took a seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. You can almost imagine what that would have been like, right? They're just chanting, the voice of a God and not of a man. The voice of a God and not of a man. Verse 23, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Verse 24, but the word of God increased and multiplied. It's a great passage, an awesome passage about how the message of Christ truly is viral, it continues to go forth, even though people are being taken out and eaten by worms. Now, let me make sure you understand who exactly King Herod is. In the New Testament, many times he's referred, to, or Herod is referred to, but it's not always the same Herod. Okay, I want to make this very clear to you. Herod the Great was what I refer to as the baby killer. Okay? He was the one who took out all the babies in Bethlehem because he was jealous when he heard that Jesus Christ was born. He didn't want any competition for the throne, and, and so he, he said, I'm going to kill all of the babies, the firstborn children. And so that was Herod the Great, who is Herod Agrippa's grandfather. Okay, just follow the line here. So Herod the Great had a son. If you're looking for baby names, here's a couple options for you. Okay, um, Aristobulus uh, had Herod Agrippa uh, the first, and Herod Agrippa had another son, Herod Agrippa the second, who was also a king. Herod Agrippa the second was the seventh king of Israel in the line of Herod. After that, uh, there were no more uh, Herods uh, of Herod's line ruling in Israel. All of the Herods, though, they, they're all pretty evil. They're 
they're all about themselves. They're prideful. A lot of them deal with crazy anxiety. I believe that Herod the Great had, had massive amounts of anxiety in his life. You can see that in some of the even things that he built for himself, the homes and, and places where he stayed. Uh, the fact that he killed all the babies, he was dealing with that kind of thing. He wasn't afraid to get rid of babies and kill babies. Also something you should not tell your children, which I did tell Chandler. I don't know why I told him that part, but he, he, he was killing babies. He was mean. He was brutal. And so he bred that in his family line. And Herod Agrippa certainly was a mean king, a brutal king. Uh, here's what I want to do. I, I want to unpack the story. I want to spend time really making sure that you get the story. And then I want to apply it to your life. If you're the kind of person that comes to a sermon and you, you love the application and you're like, come on, come on, just give it to me. I want to know what is in it for me. You like that? I promise you we will get there. That will be the dessert, okay? And I want to serve you the main course and make sure you understand all the technical aspects of what's happening in the story. So let me sh- let's, let's keep going and talking about the king. The king, Herod Agrippa, he, he was this man who killed James. We saw in verses 2 and 3. You can look at it over in in chapter 12, 12 there, he said, it says that he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword, and he saw that it displeased the Jews, and he proceeded to arrest Peter. A couple things we can know about the king. He was all about exalting himself. The second thing I think we can know is, is that he wanted to crush Christians. He was about exalting himself and crushing Christians. I believe the main reason that he wanted to kill Peter or arrest Peter was that line you can see there. It says that he pleased the Jews. It's very clear. He, he saw that his popularity was growing or his power was growing, so he went after Peter, captured him, and was probably planning to kill him as well. There's a man named Josephus who was a historian who lived at this time in the New Testament. We're greatly indebted to him. He, he wrote some amazing things during the time of the New Testament that give us some information about what's happening in these Bible stories. I want to be very clear to you. I believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. It is a historical book, but it is an inspired book. This is all we need for life and godliness, okay? I want to be very clear on that. But today, as, as I unpack this story, I want to refer to some of the things that Josephus wrote. Again, Josephus was a Jewish historian. So, so he's not inspired, but he was a historian. He lived at that time, and he wrote many great things that help us understand the context of this passage. One of the things that helps us understand the king a little bit from Josephus' writing is that Josephus continually calls him Agrippa the Great. Agrippa the Great. He even says that the Jews saw him as the great king. He was a great ruler. The Jews loved him. The Christians hated him, maybe for obvious reasons, right? He was killing Christians. They, they highly esteemed this king. There, there were other people, though, that are involved in this story. So it's not just King Herod Agrippa. We also have the people who are there, the people of Tyre and Sidon, on the crowd. But before I explain the people, let me interrupt and say, I want to be very clear about one thing. This story is about God. God is the main player in this drama. Don't for one second think it's about Herod or the people, though they are players in the story. This is a story about God. I believe it is about God because he's showing that he is the only God worthy of worship. He's saying, I am in charge of your first breath and your last breath. I'm sovereign over all things. And I also deserve all of your worship. You remember from the Ten Commandments, God said, you shall have no other God before me or besides me. He is the only God. So even if we exalt ourselves, which at many times we do, even if we put ourselves on the throne of God, he's trying to make a point to the early church and to us in this passage, there is only one God. How many gods are there? one God. There's only one God. You're not God. He's God. And he wants to be very clear with us that we are to worship him alone. So he, this story is about him and he's the main player in it. But there are other people involved in the story. The people of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon were these towns that were on the coast of Israel. They were right against the Mediterranean Sea. They would have been a little bit south They would have been independent politically. They kind of ruled themselves, and pretty much economically, they could also take care of themselves. They were not underneath the king's rule, per se. 
However, we know from this passage that they needed to have a good relationship with the king because they needed food from the Galilee region up north that that the king ruled over. They needed access to fish and grain and all that that would have been up north. So they had to keep a right relationship with him. In the first five words of verse 20, we know that the king was angry with them. We don't know why he was angry with them, but we know that he was angry with them. And they knew that if if they had the king angry at them, it would cut off their food supply. Maybe you're having trouble contextualizing this, so let's bring it to the United United States. It's like California needs Iowa. California sometimes acts like they don't need anyone else, right? But the truth is they do need the breadbasket of the United States. They need access to grain and some of the meats there. They, They can do a lot on their own, but they do need other things within the United States, other food supplies and food channels. Same was true with Tyre and Sidon. They needed access to that. Now the king is mad at them, so they knew they had to fix it quickly. Whatever they had to do to get back in his good graces, they would do it. So they went to Blastus, who is also mentioned in this passage. He's the king's chamberlain, right? Do we have any king's chamberlains here? No, okay, that doesn't surprise me. King's chamberlains are those who run the, the, the intimate quarters of the king. They, they're over his bedroom would be the translation of that. They, they are over his, his personal life. So they went straight to the core and said, Blastus, please will you give us a chance to meet with the king? Blastus grants them their wish and they get to meet with King Agrippa on an appointed day. Certainly there would have been other people to mention, the, the officials and all of the dignified people that would have come to Caesarea at this time, probably to join into the festivals. Josephus, the historian, tells us that King Agrippa held many festivals. He'd hold a festival for the emperor's birthday. He held a festival for the day Caesar was recognized. And so maybe it was around one of those times he's holding this festival Caesarea is already very busy, but now all these people are back there partying, partying, and and the the setting is perfect for God to display his glory. That's the people. Now, let me give you a little backstory. This is not in the Bible. It's, It's not specifically in this passage. It's in Josephus' writing. So track with me on this, okay? Not inspired, but historical, according to Josephus. It's a story about Agrippa that I want you to understand that will come into play later. King Agrippa at one point, according to history, was captured by King Tiberius, which was up north. He was taken, uh, before he was even a reigning king, he was taken captive and put into prison. The backstory, according to Josephus, is that while he's in prison, one day he's so grieved because he's been captured that he's leaning against a tree, just in the pain of his grief, knowing that he's now captured, and this is probably the end of his life. There's a fellow German uh, prisoner who is tied to his guard. In those times, they would have actually taken the person who was a prisoner and attached them by chain to the guard. The, the prisoner asks the guard, may I please go speak with that man leaning against the tree? The German prisoner goes over to the man leaning against the tree. Again, all in Josephus' record, historical record. I saw it with my own eyes, studied it this week. He goes over to him and he says, I need to tell you something. You are going to be great and mighty. He speaks a sort of prophecy over him, okay? Not prophecy like God inspired, but he, he, he tells him the future. He says, you're going to be a great king. You're, you're going to have lots of wealth. You're going to have lots of power. Um, you're going to have lots of happiness, he even says to him. Don't worry, this is not the end for you. But as the story goes, he's sitting there underneath this tree with this owl that is in the tree. In the Greek, it's a, bu- a babu is what it is. It, it translates owl in English, but a babu. This bird is up in the tree. My son loved that part. He's like, a babu? And I was like, yeah, a babu. A babu's in the tree, right? It's sitting there in the tree, and, and he says, when you see that bird again, you will have only five days to live. End of that story. Josephus goes on, writes all these other chapters. King Agrippa lives this life that's truly full of power, wealth, and happiness. And then we meet up with him in verses 20 through 21. Here he is now getting ready for his death moment, though he doesn't understand it. We're told, again, according to the historical record, that they met in the theater this day. The theater is that one place I told you about a couple weeks ago where I got to see Chuck Swindoll for the first time. It's a real place. You can go there. You can see it. Josephus said this happened in the theater. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly where it happened. Well, We'll we'll go with that. It probably doesn't matter exactly where it happened. It's more what happened. Here they are in this theater, and, 
And, and it says in the Bible that he put on his royal robe. It would have been customary for a king at that time to put on their royal robe and get ready to show all of their splendor before giving a speech, especially a powerful and maybe angry speech to Tyre and Sigar. Josephus writes this. He said, he put on a garment made wholly of silver and a contexture truly wonderful. He came into the theater early in the morning, at which time the garment was being illuminated by the fresh reflection of the sun's rays upon it. It shone in a surprising manner and was so resplendent as to spread horror over those that looked intently on it. So again, it gives us a little color to what's happening. His royal robe, Josephus tells us, is completely made of silver. The sun peeking up over the crest of the theater, now shining on him. And these people would have been superstitious in some ways, for sure polytheistic, meaning that they believed in many different gods. And so they see all of these things happening, and they look at this man, and he's glowing, and they're like, whoa. And the Bible tells us that they started saying, the voice of a god and not a man. The voice of a god and not a man. I love how Josephus captures this. He says, presently his flatterers cried out from one place and another. And then he puts in his own kind of parentheses, he said, though this was not for his good, understatement for sure. <laughs> they started crying out that he was God and they added, be thou merciful upon us, for although we have reverenced you only as a man, from here on out we will see you as superior to moral, mortal nature. Not okay. There's only, wait, how many gods are there? One, right? There's only one God. And so he's taking this praise of these people saying, the voice of a God and not of a man. They're telling him that he's a God. They're even asking for mercy from him. And then they say that he is superior to all men. And Josephus writes this, Upon this, the king did not either rebuke them, nor did he reject their impious flattery. And what we can see in the Bible, he didn't correct them for one second. They just continued to praise him as this man that is now a God should be worshipped above all other men. At that moment, then, he encounters his death. The Bible tells us that immediately a messenger of the Lord, an angel, appeared to him or appeared, and now he was going to breathe his last and would be eaten by worms. The story Josephus tells is just a little bit different. I trust the Bible first. Remember, that's the inspired word of God. It's straight from God, so I trust God's account more than anybody else's account, okay? But I wonder, is the account from Josephus that much different? Because how Josephus tells the story is that as they're flattering him with their words, on this rope that's hanging above, all this detail is given in Josephus' account, on this rope that's hanging above his head, this bird flies and lands on the rope, an owl. A baboon. And he sees the bird, and it says, Josephus writes, that, that as he sees this, he was immediately felt pangs of grief piercing his heart. Josephus goes on to explain that at that moment, his bowels and his stomach began to hurt intensely. And according to Josephus' account, it was five days until he breathed his last breath. But for all of those days, he was incapacitated in his throne room as the people were crying out, no, don't let our God die, don't let our God die. And according to Josephus, Agrippa could hear their cries in the street and pained by what they were crying and the pain in his own stomach, he finally breathed his last. No doubt, the judgment of God was immediate as Luke accounts in the, gospel, in, in the book of Acts. His judgment from the Lord was immediate. At that moment, he was struck down. He was eaten by worms, perhaps as Josephus accounts, from the inside out, his bowels and his stomach being eaten by worms from the inside out. But don't miss why this happened. Look at it with me in verse 23. You can underline it or circle it if you like. It said, he did not give God the glory. That is the reason that he was struck dead. He did not give God the glory. In his own pride, he received the glory and praise of men and did not direct people's eyes to the heavenly Father. That's the reason. That's what Luke wants you to get in this passage. I believe that's what God wants you to get, that we are to be people who give God the glory for all things in our life. 
Chapter 12 starts with Herod killing James. And it ends with God killing Herod. Lots of death in this chapter, but this last death is, is because God is the only one worthy of praise. And even though there was death here, the message was still viral. The gospel was going forth. Look at verse 24. It said, but the word of God increased and multiplied. So now time for dessert. Let me unpack this for you and, and give you something sweet for your soul to think about and apply to your own life. If I were to summarize this passage, if I could put it into one statement, it would, it would be this. That God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He opposed King Herod in his pride, but he gave grace to the early church as the gospel continued to go forth and the word of God increased and multiplied. That's the one statement that I believe wraps up this whole story, so important that I think we should all say it together. You ready? Let's say this together. Ready? God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I didn't write that. It's in the Bible. James, he, he wrote this in James 4, 6. James was the brother of Christ. He, he had much reason to be proud, to say, look at my family relationship that I have with Christ. Look at who I am in the early church. But he understood it isn't about him. He said, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. King Solomon, a man who owned many, many things, who was very wealthy, who was extremely wise, who had all the women you could dream of. He, he was immoral in some ways, but yet had amazing wisdom in other ways. This, even this man wrote the, that God mocks the proud mocker, but he gives grace to the humble. We also know that, that Peter, someone who was a leader in the early church in some circles was esteemed as like the first pope, right? They just loved him. He understood it wasn't about him. Remember the story of how he wouldn't let the centurion bow down at his feet? He said, no, 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 stand up. It's not about me. It's about him. He quoted this in 1 Peter 5, 5 and said, he quoted James by saying that, that, that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Listen, Solomon, James, Peter, Paul said things that were similar to this. All of them were powerful men. I don't want you to think that being humble means you can't be powerful or that by being powerful you have to be prideful. You can be powerful and still not be prideful. You can be very wealthy and have lots of money in your bank account and still be humble. You can be powerful at work and have the corner office and still be humble. You can be the leader of your family and, and, and the parent to your kids and, and the one who's passing on a legacy and, and influencing a whole line of heritage and, and still be humble. These men understood that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. You might be sitting here this morning going, well, I'm not prideful. That's prideful to think that, by the way. So, so let's, let's just evaluate your heart here for a second. If you, if you think you're not prideful, or maybe you get caught in this comparing, I'm not as prideful as so-and-so. That's prideful. Anytime you're comparing yourself to one another, whether it's about pride or about your skills or talents or, or calling or, or whatever it is, maybe it's your kids, maybe it's what the, the, the possessions that you own, when you get into this comparing game, that's prideful. And it must be uprooted in our hearts. Let me ask are you prideful in your work? As it relates to the things that you do on a daily basis, do you struggle with pride? Do you find your value and your significance in the things that you do and you accomplish more than simply seeing yourself as a child of God? When people give you words of flattery and they tell you how wonderful they think you are, do you take that internally and say, I guess I am pretty great, and start really believing it? Or do you quickly Give the glory to God. Listen, I've been around Mission Hills long enough to know that you all are really good people. And you have lots of reasons to say, wow, we are good people. And you know what? We even have a great church. And, and all of a sudden get puffed up on the goodness in your life. But you must be careful. You can't start thinking it's your own skills and your own abilities, your own knowledge that has driven you to the place that you are. You must give God the glory for all things. I found this quote this week that I want to read you. It really impacted me. 
He explains pride as a dandelion. He said pride is the dandelion of the soul. Its roots go deep. Only a little left behind sprouts again. Its seeds lodge in the tiniest encouraging cracks, and it flourishes in good soil. The danger of pride is that it feeds on goodness. In your work, in the things that you do, in the accomplishments that you have had, I must say to you, you you can't just internalize that goodness. You must give the glory back to God. I know that there are some of you who, who deal with all sorts of things in your past, and so the good things feel good because your past has been so bad, and so you put those things in your heart to make yourself feel better about yourself or better about your abilities, and sometimes that expresses itself in evil power, and, and you put other people down just to make yourself feel more powerful. That's not okay. We must not pump ourselves up on the great things that we can do or that we have done just to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. Let me, let me ask you this. Are you, are you prideful in your marriage? Are you more insistent upon your way than serving your spouse? Do you bear all things with your spouse, or, or do you plow through and simply try to get your own way? Because heaven knows that we need grace in our marriages. My wife needs all sorts of grace to be married to me, right? I need grace. She needs grace to be married to me. We need grace, but God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. That also applies in our marriages. Some of you are struggling with things in your marriage. You're fighting and bickering all the time. Perhaps it's because the seeds of pride have taken root and it's more about your way than serving your spouse. Ephesians 5 is very clear that we are to lay our lives down for our spouse. The husband is called to do that. The wife is called to submit. But these are equal things, right? Not one more sacrificial than the other. We are laying our lives down, getting rid of seeds of pride and being selfless in our marriage. Are you prideful in the raising of your kids? Are you so domineering over your kids? Are you you continually bickering with them? Maybe they're even grown adults and you're just trying to prove that you know better than they do. And so you continue to plow and plow and plow, plowing them over and hurting them, causing immense amounts of damage. Or maybe on the flip side, you find pride in your kids. It's all about what your family looks like and how great you are and how well your kids do in sports and you're, you're all about these things and you're managing your pride and you're just continually a slave to this image management in your life. Listen, Christ came to save your soul, not your image. So don't try so hard to save your image. That's pride. Submit yourself to him. Serve your family and your kids faithfully. I believe there are two main types of pride that we deal with in our life. There's the pride of superiority, which I've mentioned already, making yourself feel greater than you actually are or putting other people down so that you can exalt yourself. But we must be careful with this. James 4.10 says we must not exalt ourselves, rather we should humble ourselves before the Lord and he will exalt us. So we must be careful with the feelings of superiority in our life. The second type of pride that manifests in our life often is inferiority. I've come to grasp this statement for my own soul that a prevailing sense of inferiority is just another form of self-absorption. I struggle with this maybe more than superiority, just being vulnerable with you. There are times I look in the mirror and I'm like, I can't believe you look like that. There are times I don't like myself. There are times I just want a vacation from myself. I've said before, if somebody sold all-inclusive package vacations to get a vacation for myself, I'd pay for it. I I would love to get away from myself. There are some days we just don't like ourselves, right? We can't believe we got here. We we feel like we don't have the abilities to do what we're doing or, or we've messed things up along the way. And so we get so downcast on ourselves. And listen, when you keep looking at yourself and how how bad you think you are, you're not keeping your eyes fixed on the Lord. And the Lord said to us in Psalm 139, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. He made us. Our lives should be glorifying him in every sense of the term. You see, if we continue on in our feelings of inferiority to other people, being consumed with our own inadequacies, we're not praising God for the glory that he's due in our life and in creating us. Some people have sat in my office and said, in the counseling office and said, will you help me with my self-confidence? I'm really struggling with this. I, I don't have any self-confidence. And, and then soon they regret that they even brought it up because I say, well, I don't believe in self-confidence. 
And they usually look at me like, are, are you crazy? Everybody needs self-confidence. Maybe a better way to say it is I don't believe in self-esteem. I don't think there's a place for it within Christianity. We esteem Christ. We don't esteem self. I don't have confidence in myself. I have Christ confidence. I believe that I am made in his image. I live for him in all of his glory. All that I am is in him. My abilities are in him. I am confident in him. That's where my confidence comes from. So anything great you see in my life is only because God has done the work in a wretched sinner like me. That's how confidence should work. You see, true humility means that you're free from pride and arrogance. It means that you know who you are and that your flesh is inadequate and you grasp onto the beauty that you are now in Christ as an adopted child of God. Let me summarize it all by saying this. Humble people live for the glory of God. Humble people are quick to submit to God's lordship in their life. They understand that he's sovereign and above all things. They're quick to enroll in God's service. They'll jump on the bandwagon to serve other people, whether it's their neighbor or someone at their church or whatever it is. They want to be involved in God's purposes. And and humble people are generous to God's purposes. They give to the things of God because they realize that their life is a stewardship, not an ownership. He gave me everything that I have, so I give it back to him for his glory and for his use. You see, humble people live for the glory of God. Herod didn't get that. Herod lived for himself, and when the glory of men came towards him, he said, I will soak it up. Give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. And God warned him and then killed him, and God warns us here today. He takes pride very seriously. He's able to humble the proud. So humble yourself first before the Lord. And who's a better example of that than Jesus Christ himself? Jesus Christ humbled himself and poured himself out so that he could be like us to show us the way to God. He's the perfect example. So be like Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, We thank you for your goodness to us, goodness even to give us a story about a king eaten by worms as a warning for our own soul that you will humble the proud. Father, I'm keenly aware that pride is the mother of all sins. From it come all seeds of selfishness and uh, seeds of envy, seeds seeds of greed and lust, Lord, All of these things are so self-serving, they're prideful. And so I ask for myself and for us that you will help pull up these little seeds in our life so that they don't sprout any deeper roots than they already have. That you make us clean and pure by the blood of Christ. And that you help us esteem you and you only. That we will exalt you as the Lord of our life. And that we will not compete for your throne, but rather that we will trust that you are on it, ruling sovereignly over our life. We love you, Father. We thank you for being a good and gracious king. In your name, amen.